following interview was conducted with Professor Arnold C. Cooper for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took, it took place on um, this is April the 15th, 2008, in uh, Stewart Center Room uh, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell Thank us a little you. bit about where you were born in your early years and your parents. Okay, siblings. well, uh, I was born in Chicago in the depths of the Depression. Uh, my father had grown up on a farm as generations of Coopers had before him, but in the 20s he left the farm, joined the post office, became a railway postal clerk working in the mail car on trains that went back and forth between Chicago and Cincinnati. And um, I was born uh, in Chicago. When I was three, the family moved to Cincinnati, the other end of that uh, circuit, lived there for a while. And then uh, my folks thought it would uh, be easier to purchase a house in one of the smaller towns on that train line. So they moved to Newcastle, Indiana, which was near where uh, my parents had grown up. And uh, it was in Newcastle uh, then where I went to school and uh, where I basically did my growing up and most of my childhood memories are centered there. Uh, I graduated from Newcastle High School in 1951, um, came to Purdue that fall I still remember that day. Uh, uh, it was a great uh, event for the whole family. My brother came, my grandmother came, everybody to wish me well and wish me off. And um, I stayed in Cary Hall that first year. I was an engineering major. Uh, at the end of the first year, I decided to enter chemical engineering, which I did. And uh, had a very happy four years at Purdue. Uh, joined a fraternity, was very active in speech and debate activities at Purdue, and uh, enjoyed myself very much. Now in those days, uh, every young man faced military service, and in fact, Purdue required ROTC of every able-bodied male student, and you would see lots of uniforms on campus. Since I thought I was going to be going in the military anyway, I thought I would rather go in as an officer. So I was in ROTC all four years. Uh, after graduating from Purdue, I worked for a few months. Uh, the company I worked for, which was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I met with the Vice President of Human Resources just before go leaving to go in the Army. And he said, while you're in the Army, why don't you try to get an MBA degree? So that planted a seed in the mind of this engineer. I went in the Army in the Chemical Corps, and the Chemical Corps discovered it had too many second lieutenants. I had said goodbye to my parents for two years, and the Chemical Corps then announced, we're letting you, all of you who came in at that time, which was January, 1956. We're letting you all out after six months. You'll have a reserve obligation, but that would be the end of your active duty. And uh, I thought, maybe this is an opportunity to get that MBA degree. Uh, so I began to investigate MBA programs. I was on leave from the Army and happened to come back to campus and visited some of my old friends. And one friend uh, said they're starting a new master's program here at Purdue, a master's program in management specifically targeted at engineers. Why don't you go talk to Ron Stuckey? Ron Stuckey was one of the early faculty in the school. He, had been a, a, he was a faculty member in the School of Agriculture, in agricultural economics. I interviewed uh, Ron while I was on campus and uh, he made this new program sound so exciting that I decided not to pursue any of the other MBA programs I was looking at and uh, decided to enter that first program. And so it was that uh, now I Now what was, year was this be? This was uh, 1956. And uh, 
the program started that September of 1956, and uh, I can say I was here the first morning of the first day when the school started. Um, they had remodeled the back end of what was called the biology annex, or the Stanley Coulter annex, on the second floor. They had created a case classroom with two uh, U-shaped uh, rows of uh, uh, desks, one slightly higher than the other, so that uh, you could have about 35 or 40 people in that room, and we could all see each other, and uh, there could be an interchange of ideas. The first class on that uh, Monday morning was taught by Emmanuel Weiler, who later became the first dean of the school. It was managerial economics. He talked some about the program, uh, and then he began to teach. And I suppose you could say that the course began, and the program began, and the school began at that point. And that morning? I, I suppose that... Uh, Looking back, someone should have blown a trumpet at that point, but uh, that did not happen. And we started, there were, I think, 34 students in that first class, oh. all men, all men, uh, mostly veterans, mostly Purdue alumni, mostly Purdue engineering alumni, a lot of crew cuts. At that time, I had some hair so I could have a crew cut, and um, uh, Quite a few people had uh, a good deal of experience. And um, the initial faculty, kind of the nucleus of the faculty, were some people who had come from the Harvard Business School. Uh, just to go back for a moment, Emanuel Weiler had been hired from the University of Illinois in 1953 to create a separate department of economics at Purdue. Prior to that time, economics had not been a separate department. It had been combined with history and government and had primarily taught service courses. Uh, he came in 1953, initially hired a lot of very bright economists, and then three years later began uh, this new program in industrial management, uh, the first management program at Purdue. Um, the concept of the program was one of having an integrated program in which the faculty knew what was happening in all of the different courses. There was heavy use of the case method, which was a reflection of uh, the methodology used at the Harvard Business School. The program also had a, a good deal of quantitative emphasis, reflective of uh, the orientation they wanted to give to the program. and. Uh, the faculty very much uh, were seeking feedback. You almost had a sense that they would do something and then would say, what do you think? And you give feedback and they continue. And all of that was uh, uh, made it exciting. You had the feeling you were participating in a new program even as it was being designed and was taking place. And um, that first program, uh, uh, it was uh, the what is today called the MSIA, Master of Science in Industrial Administration program. It was one calendar year in length. Most MBA programs were two years. The faculty felt, though, that uh, if they coordinated the program tightly, if they had a heavy workload, and if they did not offer a lot of specialization, that one year would give a very solid grounding in management to these students, most of whom were engineers and in a sense had a specialty already. And um, during that program, uh, Ron Stuckey called me into his office one day and he asked, have you ever thought about being a professor? And I said, no. And he said, uh, well, why don't you give it some thought? You might want to uh, get a doctorate and then come back here and teach. Well, that planted a seed, another seed. I guess in those days that was very suggestible. People would plant seeds and they would grow. And um, I thought about it, but I, I was not sure. And as I neared the end of that first year, I was out of money, I was tired. 
I thought, uh, well, some management experience beyond what I have would not be a bad thing. So I went to work for Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. And uh, that next year, worked for P&G, enjoyed it. Uh, very nice people. Lived in a house with uh, six other engineers. Uh, we hired a lady who cleaned it and cooked the evening meal. It was very pleasant. But as I looked ahead and uh, looked at the jobs of, of people who were, uh, had been with the company longer, I, I thought, I think it would be more interesting to be a professor. And um, so I wrote back to some of the faculty here and with their help then prepared my application. Now you're supposed to apply to many different doctoral programs, but I was too naive to know that and only applied to one program, I applied to the Harvard Business School. Fortunately, I was uh, admitted and um, prepared to go then in the fall of 1958. I had got my master's in 57, worked for one year in Cincinnati, and prepared to go to Boston in the fall of 58. Now, as a side note, a personal matter, I had learned that uh, as a bachelor, it took a little while to meet girls in a new city. So I began to ask friends, do you know any girls in Boston? And began to prepare a list. It just happened that I was in my hometown visiting my folks, and my best friend from high school was visiting his parents. He had just gotten his PhD in chemistry from Harvard and had just been married. And he and his wife were visiting his parents. We got together. We talked. Uh, I, before we parted, I asked uh, the question, do you know any girls in Boston? And uh, he and his wife said, well, Jean Lord is a nice girl, and she may still be there. So she went down as number four on the list, which we <laughs> still joke about. Uh, we are nearing our 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and um, so I entered the doctoral program at Harvard in the fall of 58. And um, Jean and I were married one year later in September of 59. Um, what was she doing? Is she from she Boston was, area? Uh, she had graduated from Wellesley College and uh, was working initially with a doctor who was doing public health research. But then, see, she switched. She had been an English major, and uh, she became an editorial assistant at the Harvard Business Review. And um, uh, so we were married in September of 59, lived in a little attic apartment, I jokingly say, I know she did not marry me for my money because no one is poorer than graduate students. And um, uh, we uh, began our life together in that way. And I began to work in the area of uh, new and small firms, particularly working with a, a senior professor named W. Arnold Hosmer. And uh, he, had, uh, he had taught accounting. Uh, for many years, but in the last years of his career, he was working um, in an, a new course he developed called Small Manufacturing Enterprises. And he had been involved in the founding of two such firms and um, felt there really needed to be a course of that sort. Many of the companies that were studied were high technology, growth oriented firms, and I began to work for him. Uh, it, as was typical of the Harvard Business School doctoral program, I um, wrote cases for him for one year, then did my doctoral dissertation under his supervision. And as I finished, I was interviewing, uh, it was a, primarily a three-year program, and um, as I was finishing, uh, I was interviewing some schools, but then an opportunity developed to stay at Harvard and to teach with him in that, uh, initially with him in that area, it was a growing course. And uh, so I thought I'd better take advantage of that opportunity and stayed on at uh, the Harvard Business School. Our daughter was born then that year in 1961. We, uh, the salary went up some then, uh, so we were able to buy some of her own furniture and moved out of that furnished attic apartment and felt uh, 
our living standard was very high indeed. And uh, then from 1961 to 1963, I taught at the Harvard Business School. The second year, I added a course in uh, cost accounting that I was teaching, and that was in a program called the Harvard Radcliffe Program in Business Administration. At that time, Harvard did not, as a matter of policy, admit women to their MBA program. And, uh, but Radcliffe College, which was affiliated with Harvard, had a one-year program, and uh, many very bright young women went into that program and then went into business. And so I taught in that program. Incidentally, in 1963, when I left Harvard, uh, that was the time they decided to admit women into the MBA program, and they did away with the Harvard Radcliffe program. Uh, I had kept in touch with faculty here at uh, Purdue in the School of Management, now the Krenner School of Management, and uh, they made a, a very nice offer to me to return and to join the faculty here. So uh, I brought my wife out here to the wilds of the Midwest with our new baby girl, and uh, I can still remember very clearly as we drove up State Street and uh, the new Cranert building was under construction at that time. Uh, great improvement over the dingy old Stanley Kohler annex where it had all started. Much had changed by then. Uh, it was uh, in 1958, uh, it became a separate school. Prior to that, the faculty had been in the School of Humanities, Social Science, and Education. Uh, including the original economics faculty. But the master's program was in the School of Engineering, an awkward setup, I'm sure. And in 1958, they created a separate school of management. I believe it was 1962 that a generous gift from Herman Krannert, the founder of Inland Container Corporation, uh, came to the school and it became the Krannert School of Management. And uh, some of that money went toward the construction of the new building, uh, which uh, was then underway. But I returned to the old Stanley Calder Annex, and uh, that's where I taught initially from uh, 63 until we moved into the new building, which was during spring vacation of 1965, a year and three quarters after I had come back. Um, much had changed. The faculty had grown a great deal. Um, the master's program was, uh, uh, had more than doubled. Uh, there was an undergraduate program. I believe the first undergraduate students received their degree, I believe, in 1961. There was a PhD program. Initially, the economists were most active in that, and they were beginning to produce some excellent doctoral students went on to do very well. And um, uh, there was really a sense that the school was on the move. Uh, it continued to have uh, an integrated uh, approach to its programs. And I might add here, here was a way in which Purdue had evolved and developed that was different from many state universities. Many state universities which set up business schools started with undergraduate business schools. They often be, were departmentalized, highly specialized, and looked at things from the specialized point of view of, say, marketing or finance or accounting, and then later added master's programs which often reflected uh, uh, those diverse points of view. Uh, the Krannert uh, programs, uh, and this was the case with the Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management program, as well as the master's program, were started by a group of faculty who believed in an integrated general management program in which each student would study a broad set of courses. Don't tell me you're not interested in marketing. Everybody studies marketing. Everybody studies finance, accounting, operations. It uh, was similar, I think, to... Uh, law schools and to medical schools in the sense that uh, uh, the thinking was a pro for a professional program there was a broad core that any professional ought to know. 
The programs were highly integrated. One of the early faculty that played a very prominent role was John C. T. S. E., who was the an early director of the master's program. He would get the faculty together, and we would go through each course week by week. What are you going to cover? And they'd consider how to all fit together. Um, so that philosophy uh, was important in the early development of the school. There was not a lot of specialization at uh, uh, the master's or the undergraduate pro level. Uh, for a number of years into the 1970s, the master's program that was primarily offered was the one-year MSIA program, which offered little opportunity for specialization. The Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management was an undergraduate program that was pursued by many students who transferred out of engineering or science, and it had a technical minor as part of it. And uh, that program was very popular with recruiters, and uh, many of those students did very well. There was also a Bachelor of, initially, a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Economics which was the oldest program at the school, and it was taught into the early 70s, I believe, and then that was phased out, and we had the Bachelor of Science uh, uh, in Management, uh, which was a more general business program, but again, when compared to, for instance, many of our Big Ten counterparts, was much less uh, specialized than many of those programs, more integrated, uh, there was a philosophy of emphasis upon what I would call active learning, um, in which many of the classes, uh, cases, problems, projects were used, in which the students were expected to discuss what they had prepared when they came to class. And that's rather different from a passive listen to the lecture kind of approach. Uh, so any anyway, those were some of the uh, early uh, aspects of my career and uh, of the school. Very good. That's nice. Now we'll go on and talk a little bit about some of the areas. And strategic management was one of the areas that you were involved in. Yes. And entrepreneurship. <clears throat> well, in the in the early days, uh, the faculty was small, and uh, that meant often you taught a lot of more a lot of different things. Um, my uh, second year, uh, I came in the first year I was uh, at, at joined the faculty in 1963. I taught what was called business policy. And that later uh, was called strategic management. It was an integrative course that looked at problems that cut across a single functional area. Uh, it tended to be a course uh, which made heavy use of cases uh, and um, tended to be toward the end of, of programs, and that was the case here. Uh, I also, my first year, was asked to teach a, a report writing course called Managerial Policy Reports. And in that course, the students had to hand in a written analysis of a case every couple of weeks. The students uh, and I had a lot in common. They did not like that course, and neither did I. <laughs> but interestingly, alumni, often said it was very valuable. This having to learn to write and to write concisely and to boil the facts down and to assemble them in a way that they uh, made, uh, presented coherent arguments uh, in support of particular positions. My second year here, there was a crisis in the finance area and I was asked to teach finance. So I taught finance. And then finally my third year here, things uh, settled down more in terms of what I was to teach. And uh, from that point forward, primarily I taught courses in entrepreneurship and small business and in business policy and strategic management. These were similar in that they tended to take a general management point of view to look at the total business. And uh, in those days, uh, both entrepreneurship and what we now call strategic management we're in very uh, early stages of development. Um, there uh, 
was not a lot in the way of accumulated research. Uh, there was not a lot in, in terms of uh, the professional infrastructure of societies and journals. They were experiential courses in which you gave the students cases and uh, guided the students as they worked their way through that, and there was, it was an inductive way of learning. Uh, it was later, though, that um, the bodies of research associated with these areas began to develop, and later that the professional infrastructures began to develop. It was in um, 1970 that uh, I was involved in organizing what I think was the first academic research conference in entrepreneurship. Uh, the Cranert School put up some money, and a foundation called the Center for Venture Management put up some money, and we organized a conference here at Purdue, found 12 um, faculty around the country who had been doing research relating to technical entrepreneurship, the founding and development of technically oriented firms. They um, assembled here. Uh, it was an exciting conference. It was the first time that people were able to present research, interrupt each other and ask questions, compare uh, findings and approaches, and uh, I think might be viewed as one of the beginning points in the development of that field. Uh, we were hard pressed to find 12 people who could present uh, work. It was two years after that, in 1972, that uh, the Professional Society, the Academy of Management, uh, for the first time organized as divisions. Prior to that time, uh, their meetings had been uh, general ones in which papers on a wide variety of topics were presented. But after that time, uh, divisions, uh, and uh, the relevant one here was what was then called the Division of Business Policy. It later became the Division of Business Policy and Strategy. But their first program, I remember attending in 1972, there were seven papers that presented. There are now 5,000 members of that organization, but it was a humble beginning. Now, to go back uh, to my own career, uh, that's, those were some things happening in the fields. Uh, it was very common in the 1960s and 1970s for faculty to be taking leaves of absence and going to other schools. It was easier then uh, if there were two career families were not so common. And in 1967, after I had been here for four years, I received an invitation to go to Stanford University to teach in the Graduate School of Business there. And uh, Stanford was regarded as one of the very top uh, business schools. I thought I would learn a lot there. Uh, and uh, so uh, we drove west in 1967 to Palo Alto and um, uh, lived there for a year. We th by then we had two children. Our son David had joined us. And I taught at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. I also at that time began to do research on the founding of technologically based firms. I, um, it, it, when I had been in Boston, I had studied many of the companies that are sometimes referred to as the Route 128 firms, those that founded around the outskirts of Boston, high technology firms. I came here to West Lafayette and I thought, where are the high technology firms? This is one of the leading engineering universities in the world, but there doesn't seem to be much entrepreneurship. And that was a, a question that was going over my mind. Why does this happen at some times and places and not other times and places? The invitation to go to Stanford and to be located for a year in what was becoming Silicon Valley presented an opportunity to do research. And uh, so that year I began to study the, uh, through um, interviewing people and uh, also gathering data about companies that had come and gone. Uh, began to study the founding process in trying to answer those questions. Uh, what influences the processes by which new firms are founded? 
why does this occur at some times and places and not at others? And uh, in, then in the summer of 1969, I had support from a foundation, went back to Stanford for the summer with my family, and continued the study of those firms. And in total, gathered data on the founding of 250 new high-technology firms and uh, was able then uh, to, to develop some articles and some insights uh, based upon that work. Um, and in fact, that first entrepreneurship conference, which we organized here at Purdue in 1970, uh, that became the first forum at which I presented uh, some of that work I had done. Um, then uh, for the family, in 1972, I had the opportunity to go to England. And um, uh, the British government had set up two new business schools, one the London Business School, the second the Manchester Business School, each somewhat separate from their university system, somewhat on the American model. And um, uh, I had contacts at the Manchester Business School, and uh, my family and I went there for six months. Uh, it was great fun for the family. Our kids picked up British accents. And uh, I had the opportunity to study and teach entrepreneurship there at that time. Uh, 1974, I had the invitation to uh, go on a lecture tour of South Africa. And uh, we left the children with the uh, grandparents, my wife's parents. My wife joined me for much of that time when we went down to South Africa. And I taught primarily in the non-white universities, moving from one university to another. We set up a scholarship in each of uh, the universities. And that was a, a very stimulating experience, looking at entrepreneurship in a, a, a very different kind of setting. And uh, then it was back to Purdue. And uh, in 1977-78, I received an invitation to teach in Switzerland. And there was an international management development center in Lausanne, Switzerland, on Lake Geneva. And uh, it had been uh, it, uh, very much helped along by the Harvard Business School, which had played a role in recruiting faculty for the school and helping them to shape their curriculum. Much of their teaching was executive development with uh, middle-level managers and senior managers. and. Um, I had an invitation to go there for the academic year 77, 78. So we went there. Our children went to international schools. Uh, and uh, the program at uh, and the school is now called IMD. Uh, but it was very international. The typical uh, class would have men from maybe 25 different countries in the same class. I say men because all of the students were men. Incidentally, that was a characteristic of business education for a number of years. There were relatively few women. And uh, that, of course, has changed today. It's one of the many things that had changed. But um, being there in Switzerland for a year was uh, a very stimulating experience. And uh, I learned a lot from teaching these people who were uh, facing management challenges in a wide variety of countries. and. Uh, uh, so at the end of some of the classes, I felt I'd probably learn more than the students had. And probably a variety of industries as well. Oh, indeed. Very much so. And uh, so that was fun. Now, meanwhile, back here at the school, the, uh, the programs were all developing. Um, the industrial economics curriculum was phased out and the Bachelor of Science in Management program. Now, that is in addition to the Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management program, which continued. The BSIM program had the technical minor. Many of the students had transferred out of engineering or science. Bachelor of Science in Management was a more general program, and uh, it attracted large numbers of students. And in fact, one of our challenges during the 1970s was how to manage our enrollment because it was growing so rapidly, and it reflected a nationwide trend. Um, the, um, uh, 
doctoral program at the credit school was absolutely flourishing during that time. Many students were being placed at Ivy League schools, the very best schools in the world. Um, the master's program was uh, doing well. We, uh, during uh, that time, I think less emphasis was placed on trying to recruit engineers and scientists, and it became a more diverse uh, student body uh, in terms of academic background. And then during the 1970s, the two-year Master of Science in Management uh, program was uh, put into place, uh, and um, uh, that was more like MBA programs at other schools. Uh, it did provide the opportunity for more specialization. Many of the faculty welcomed that because they could teach electives also. Many of the students were interested in that, in acquiring, for instance, uh, specialization in marketing or finance or other areas. And uh, uh, that program then in time began to cannibalize the one-year uh, bachelor, uh, Master of Science in Industrial Administration. And I think that reflected primarily that the two-year MBA degree, at least in the United States, had become very well accepted. And uh, from the standpoint of many companies, many recruiters, that uh, was what they expected. Uh, another change that occurred uh, uh, nationwide was that uh, whereas in the 50s and 60s when the school started, many students came straight out of undergraduate programs. Increasingly, recruiters and companies began to look for students with additional experience. And so MBA programs uh, began to emphasize in their recruiting students who had experience. And uh, so you had, um, it became less common to have students who would come straight out of an undergraduate program. Uh, but those were some of the things happening during the 1970s. Okay, very good. Um, what, do you want to continue on with any other changes? There are some other okay. things that you well, get involved in. Okay, well, let's, let's see. During the um, uh, 1980s, uh, the school uh, continued to, to grow. We, we put into effect in the early 1980s uh, some policies related to what we called the lower division and the upper division of the undergraduate program. And st the lower division was the first two years, and students had to have grade, a certain grade average typically about a B average in a set of five courses in order to move into the upper division. And this uh, uh, meant that uh, uh, weaker students who really were not uh, uh, maybe doing very well in the program tended to transfer out. Uh, they tended to be replaced by a lot of very good students who did come in. And it enabled us to have some control, or some management over the size of the program. Uh, and I think in the long run that has been a, a very good thing. Um, the master's program, the two-year Master of Science in Management program, which years later we changed the name to the MBA program to correspond to the term most often used uh, in, <coughs> in higher education. But that program uh, uh, took a lot of students away from the one-year uh, Master of Science in Industrial Administration program. And in that sense, we became more like other two-year MBA schools. We continued, though, I think, to have more emphasis upon integration, a lot of emphasis upon active learning. And um, uh, I think we were more quantitative than many schools were. Um, the doctoral program continued to have a lot of success. In the early 1980s, we then added programs in executive education. And uh, in American business schools, this had been a very important development. And uh, it uh, reflected the fact that companies often would send their executives not only to degree programs, but to short programs that might uh, uh, enable them to uh, develop skills that would help them move ahead in their careers. Sometimes these were programs relating to particular topic areas. 
and uh, that program of executive education, it was initially headed by my colleague Dan Schindel. Later, uh, it was headed by Bill Llewellyn, and uh, it led then in the 1980s to the construction of a new building to the west of the Cranard School where executive education classes were held. And that kind of education uh, is very stimulating for the faculty. You're working with uh, managers who have a lot of experience. Uh, part of the challenge in the classroom is trying to tap into that experience in a constructive way. Uh, often those programs um, are financially rewarding for schools too because companies are, uh, it, it, the real cost for a company is giving up these people for a period of time and they're often willing to pay uh, pretty well then for those programs if the programs are well done. And uh, so that became an important component of the programs of the Cranard School and continues so uh, to this day. One of the challenges the Cranard School faced was we had a very visible faculty, a lot of very good faculty. And um, often other schools would come along and make uh, very nice offers and hire these people away. And so that was a challenge. Um, the, from my own standpoint, uh, through the 1980s, I was uh, uh, here the entire time. I was not uh, at other universities as I had been earlier, partly that reflects where your family is in its life cycle. And um, coming back then to the development of these fields of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and strategic management, it was during the 1980s that uh, they really began to develop. Uh, the Strategic Management Journal was started by my colleague Dan Schindel in 1981. It became the leading journal in that field. Uh, in Entrepreneurship, the Journal of Business Venturing was started in 1985. It became the leading specialized journal in that area. Uh, the infrastructure of, the pro of those fields in the sense of uh, the presence of professional societies, of specialized journals and the accumulation of knowledge, knowledge about the educational process, knowledge uh, about uh, what we were studying, uh, began to develop. And so uh, it became possible to have a larger research component in the courses. And uh, all of this was, I think, uh, very good. Uh, within Cranert, we were one of the early schools to have uh, a doctoral specialization in strategic management. Uh, many of our earlier students went, uh, did very well and uh, became themselves important contributors to the field. And uh, uh, we had at Cranert, we, we became uh, the only school that had three pe different people who served as chair of the Division of Business Policy and Strategy of the Academy of Management. As I mentioned earlier, that organization after very humble beginnings back in the early 70s, now has about 5,000 members. Um, and uh, the entrepreneurship field was developing somewhat more slowly, but uh, again, uh, and, and that was exciting to be in on these fields as they were developing. And you would meet and people would be talking about what should be the boundaries of the field, and how do you measure things, and what should be the focus of research, and um, it, uh, it was exciting, it was creative uh, to be uh, a part of those things, and then uh, working with doctoral students to help them contribute, and they would go on with their careers, and that was exciting. So I, I feel uh, very fortunate to have been in fields as they were developing. and. Um, uh, the process continued through uh, the 90s and uh, into uh, uh, past 2000. I went on uh, half-time, uh, moving toward retirement in the year 2000. My wife said I was not very good at half-time, but uh, it uh, provided some uh, transition. Uh, some exciting things uh, happened to me that uh, um, I feel very fortunate about. Um, in uh, Sweden, they had uh, wanted to encourage entrepreneurship, 
and uh, they set up an international award uh, for lifetime contributions in the area of entrepreneurship and small business research. And um, uh, the first year they uh, awarded, uh, made that award to a man named David Birch, who had done some very influential work on showing that much of the new job generation had occurred, was occurring in new and small firms. And in 1997, I remember in April of that year, I was at home that morning because our refrigerator was broken. And uh, the refrigerator repairman was there working on it, and the phone rang. And it was a professor calling from Sweden to tell, uh, to tell me that I had won that international award of $50,000 and wondering if I could come to Sweden for a lecture tour and so on. And part of my mind was thinking, isn't this great? And part of my mind was thinking, my, I'm glad that refrigerator is getting repaired. Uh, but that uh, led then that fall to uh, a lecture tour in Sweden. Uh, my wife and I were fortunate. We were able then to take that $50,000 prize and set it up uh, as a scholarship fund for Cranard students. But uh, that was a, a very nice uh, a capstone. And uh, having been involved in the early stages of uh, the development of that field, it, it was very rewarding to have that recognized. I would say so, absolutely. You're also in the uh, um, one founding people in the Great Book of Teachers, the one at Purdue. Yes, I, I always devoted a lot of time to teaching. Uh, the, the thing that really motivated me to go into uh, the field was I thought I would enjoy teaching. And uh, I found it demanding, but I found it rewarding. And um, I, I was very fortunate to, to win a number of teaching awards uh, through the years, uh, including the Murphy Award, which is the university-wide award uh, that's given for undergraduate teaching, the Salvo Norman for master's teaching. Uh, uh, the Academy of Management gave me the Coleman Mentor Award, uh, which is more for working with doctoral students. And uh, I was a founding member of the Teaching Academy, which was set up to encourage and support teaching uh, here at Purdue. Uh, my name is engraved in the Book of Great Teachers uh, in the Union, and I, I was very fortunate. I, I, and I think uh, one of the things that... Um, uh, when you think in any career, okay, what is uh, uh, what is your monument? What uh, your legacy? Uh, yeah. What what uh, what difference did you make? And uh, I suspect that for many uh, who have been professors, it is those thousands and thousands of students you have taught. And uh, I would sometimes find in traveling, I, I would happen to meet someone. They'd say Professor Cooper. And uh, maybe it was someone I had taught 30 years earlier. And, um, but that's very rewarding. You, you hope you have made a difference. You hope that I sometimes would say, well, I, I give lifetime benefits. If uh, in the future you have trouble going to sleep at night, imagine you're in my class and you'll drop right off. But uh, you also That's hope that, um, uh, that as your students think back, they'll, they'll feel that uh, uh, they got something from it, they developed skills and, uh, that were useful to them. And I en enjoyed teaching. Uh, I gave uh, essay exams. I, I taught all together for 44 years. I gave essay exams. I graded them myself. That was the least enjoyable part of the job to have a great stack, maybe a hundred exams to grade. Uh, I learned that the best way to do that was to go home. Don't stay in your office where there will be interruptions, because if you're halfway through a paper and get interrupted, then you have to start in all over again. Right. So, but I did that. That was part of the job, uh, provide feedback for the students. And, um, but, and so I, I feel very fortunate, and, and the teaching is a, a very important and rewarding part of it. I tended to use a lot of cases, and 
the first day of class, and particularly with undergraduate students, uh, I would talk to them that uh, this may be different from some of the other courses they had had. I would say some of the courses you have had, you can study in spurts. You can come to class, take notes, and then the night before exam, do a lot of reading, review your notes, and you can get along just fine. I would say, though, this is not that kind of a course. This is a course in which we'll learn primarily by working together and analyzing cases about real businesses and the problems they face. For this method to work, you have to come to class prepared. You have to come to class prepared to talk. And uh, I want to warn you, I shall call upon you. Sometimes I call upon people who look like they don't want to be called upon. But now why do I do this? The night before, I know there are many demands upon your time. It would be very easy the night before to say, well, I'll give a quick glance at this case, and then I'll go, and if something occurs to me, I'll volunteer. Otherwise, I'll just listen. Well, if everybody prepares like that, we're going to have a very poor class, regardless of what I do. But if the night before you think, that son of a gun looks like he's going to call on me, I'd better prepare them. And you come to class having analyzed it, having thought about it. Then you've got something to contribute. Others have something to contribute, and we'll have an exciting class, almost regardless of what I do. Uh, incidentally, I got uh, an email a couple of years before I retired. <laughs> and it was from a student I had taught, I think, 25 years earlier. And I still remembered it. I had made that talk the first day of class. And uh, then the next class was the first case. And I called upon the student who was up in the top right-hand corner, and he said, I'm not prepared. And I called on the student next to him, and he said, I'm not prepared. Well, I stopped and chewed the class out, and we went on. And Interestingly, those students were prepared very well after that. And this email I received, which was 25 years later, was from that student I called on. And he said he still remembered that. And he said, every time I'm thinking about not being prepared on the job, I recall. It stuck, it stuck in right. <laughs> in line with that, in entrepreneurship, could you comment on the Burton Dean uh, Mor Morgan Interpreneurial Competition? Well, the researchers that. that uh, lot of, now, often in entrepreneurship courses, you ask students to develop, to come up with a plan for a new business, an idea, and to develop a plan in support of that. A plan that could be presented to prospective investors. And so through the years, I had many students who did that. Uh, a lot of excellent business plans. Some went on to start businesses. Most did not, because the typical student, while still a student, is that's not the best time usually to start a business. Um, and uh, then later, Purdue developed business plan competitions. And today, the Burton Morgan Center uh, one of the uh, set of things they do, and I think do very well, is to have uh, uh, business plan competitions, mm -hmm. and they are able to engage uh, many of the students in engineering and science and across the campus. And I think those are great uh, learning experiences. They also have business plan competitions, which attract many people who are already out of school and uh, uh, often who see opportunities connected with their work. And uh, so those are, are great learning experiences. And those contests, sometimes they will bring in professional venture capitalists, experienced entrepreneurs who can provide feedback and sometimes assistance. And it's been going on for a long time. Well, uh, yes, I don't in, remember yeah. what year would be the first year of that, but uh, uh, there have been such... Uh, uh, th those plans connected with the Burton Morgan competition uh, have been going on for 
quite a few years here. Even when, yeah. even when he was, I remember, he used to visit, he used to read when he was still alive. Yes. Oh, well, Bert Morgan was quite a character, a successful entrepreneur. It started to, and backed a number of businesses, used to come to campus. Uh, he uh, uh, was a real character. And uh, he believed in what he was doing, and he was, uh, he set up a chair, which is in the Cranert School, and uh, later um, uh, funded the Burton Morgan Center through his foundation days. And uh, so those programs continue. Burton Morgan is gone now, but some of those things that he had hoped for and uh, wanted to support continue, and I'm sure he'd be very proud I'm of what's sure. been That's accomplished. Right. Yeah. Um, you received, you've been, did you participate in the alumni here? Because it's nice you got the John S. Day Distinguished Alumni Academic well, Award. The, the John S. Day Distinguished mm -hmm. Alumni Award is given by the Cranert School to okay. an alumnus of the school who has been active and uh, has, has achieved some success in the academic world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I received that, I think it was 2002, and that was uh, satisfying also. Right, that's right. As you look, what is your, one of your fondest memories of Purdue? Do you have a fond memory of Purdue? Well, um, or more? I, when I first came here as a freshman in 1951, uh, 57 years ago, I certainly never expected that I would spend uh, much of my life, <laughs> my career would be centered here. But that is the way it's worked out. So there, there have been so many fond memories. And um, uh, I... I believe in Purdue in so many ways. Um, uh, I think uh, many of the Purdue students are very satisfying to work with. I think uh, there tends to be a good work ethic. Uh, many of them are upwardly mobile. They're moving up in uh, the world. Their parents are supporting them in this process. I can identify with that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's uh, that sort of thing is... Uh, uh, just exactly what uh, this state and this country needs. Um, but there's so many uh, fond memories, uh, many of them center upon students, but also upon colleagues whom I've enjoyed working with through the years. And uh, I, I, I remember as a young man, almost every young person thinks, what am I going to do in my life? I wonder what uh, path uh, I may follow. And uh, I feel very fortunate. I, I think I ended up doing uh, some things that uh, were a good match with my abilities and interests, and uh, that I've enjoyed very much. And uh, now I'm no longer now I'm retired. I retired in 2005, but uh, I continue to be somewhat involved and uh, to gain satisfaction from looking at the success of the university and of the school. Very good. Any, and you know, how about an outstanding event? You got one of those that you'd like to share? Well, it's, it's hard to say. That award I got when I went to Sweden uh, mm. was presented in the City Hall at Sweden where they present the Nobel Prizes, and uh, that was pretty hard to beat. Um, when I retired in 2005, uh, Purdue awarded me an honorary Doctor of Management degree, and that was very satisfying. Did you know in advance that you were going to get that, or did it come? I received a letter beforehand okay. that okay. Uh, advised me of that. And I usually so, ask people that. Sometimes it's a surprise, and sometimes they know. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting. Our, my family was able to be here, uh -huh. and that was uh, that was very satisfying. Uh, so there've been a, a lot of events, but then um, well, the la the last class that I had, uh, my wife came and sat in uh, one of the last classes. She thought, well, this is one of the last chances to see what I do when I go off to work each morning. And uh, the last class, uh, uh, some of the doctoral students asked if they could come and uh, sit in on the class also. This, these were master's students, MBA students primarily, and uh, taught the last class. The students uh, stood and applauded. One of the doctoral students came down and presented me with a bouquet of flowers. Uh, the students, one by one, shook my hand. Uh, That's very nice. Yes. Very nice. 
I think on that note, I think I want to thank you very much for this. Thank interview. you. My pleasure. It's thank you been very a pleasure. Much. Thank pleasure. you.